Hello, fellow peacemakers. It's Lily. Welcome back to episode 38 of Make Peace Not Beef. I know it's been a while because I was actually on vacation with my mom and our friend in Mexico over a week ago, so I took a brief break from podcasting. <laughs> it was a much needed break. Now, we've been anticipating for this trip, and I've just been so excited because this was my first trip since COVID started, and I absolutely had a blast. And also, of course, picked up some useful Spanish on the way, such as, Guapo, como te llamas? Me encanta tu estilo. Quieres para conmigo? JK. We got to visit Mexico City, then we drove to the beautiful city of San Miguel de Allende, which is actually a UNESCO World Heritage City situated in the central highlands of Guanajuato State. With well-preserved Spanish colonial architecture, and the city has got a breathtaking view, so it's definitely worth checking out if you're ever in Mexico. Then we drove around the mountains and hilly terrains to arrive at the famous Guanajuato City, which is a historic city full of houses painted with vibrant colors ranging from emerald green to pink to lavender before we headed back to Mexico City. Now, I want to give a shout out to Clara, who is our trusted friend and awesome tour guide on this trip and the only person who speaks Fu in Spanish. Clara, girl, I know you listen to my podcast, so thank you so much for all your support. I had so much fun meeting you and traveling with you, and gosh, I already miss our epic adventures, bar hops, and late night rooftop chats in Guanajuato. And yes, to everybody else, rest assured, I'm double vaccinated and I took precautions on this trip. Now, the only thing I'm not too proud of is how many plastic bottles I ended up using on this trip, because I was told that it's not safe to drink the tap water in Mexico. And trips like this remind me of how privileged and lucky I am to be living in Toronto where I have access to unlimited clean drinking water. And it reminds me that, you know, many other countries in this world still don't have adequate access to clean drinking water or the infrastructure for water treatment. So I am extremely blessed and I will continue to do my part to save water and minimize single use plastic back home. But anyway, peacemakers, the dopest chick on the planet is back. Okay, that was a super long intro. So now, before I get into today's episode, I want to first apologize for the poor audio quality in the previous episode, which was episode 37, Do Asians Care About Climate Change? That was completely my fault. So due to poor internet connection, we couldn't really hear Bill clearly for the most part. So unfortunately, the episode didn't really do the content justice. But going forward, I'm definitely going to exercise more stringent quality control to make sure that the production quality is of the highest grade. Anyway, today I'm doing a solo episode again, and we're going to talk about the environmental impact of supermarkets. <laughs> yes, that's Walmart, Costco, Target, or Whole Foods, if you're extra fancy, you know, wherever you get most of your groceries from. And you're probably thinking, what? Why supermarkets? And I'll tell you what inspired me to do an episode on this, right? So a few weeks ago, I was on a work on climate Zoom call, learning about a company called Axiom Cloud, which uses software to minimize energy consumption and inefficiencies associated with cooling and refrigeration. Now, before you go, ah, boring. I'll tell you why this is super important. So I learned that cooling alone consumes about 25 to 30 percent of electricity worldwide, and it's responsible for 8 to 10 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. <laughs> Can you believe that? That is quite significant. And in a grocery store or a supermarket like Walmart, Target, or Loblaws if you live in Canada, roughly 55 to 60 percent of the electricity bill comes from cooling and refrigeration. And 25% of that is actually from refrigerant leaks, which is a huge problem in every supermarket. That is a lot of energy wasted and a lot of greenhouse gas emitted. Just picture all the frozen food sections in a supermarket. You know, ice cream, yogurt, dairy, meat, frozen meals, all of that. The cooling systems are running 24-7 to keep the food at optimal temperature so your mango sorbet doesn't melt or go bad. And, uh, yeah, that generates a hefty electricity bill. But, you know, supermarkets are kind of necessary when you live in a densely populated city like me, because not everyone has access to farmer's markets. And, by the way, there's a really simple way to significantly reduce energy usage of cooling and refrigeration systems in supermarkets, which is to simply add a door or a cover or a nightshade to these open display cases 
so the cold gas won't escape the fridge. Today, let's do a deep dive on which supermarket is the most and least eco-friendly and talk about how to choose where to shop. And <laughs> because according to Anchor Statistics, 42% of my listeners are Americans, we're going to focus on American supermarkets because majority wins. Sorry for listeners who don't live in America. Rest assured, there's still a lot to learn from this episode, so be sure to stick around. I love you all equally. So after finding out just how much electricity is consumed by cooling and refrigeration alone, and considering that most supermarkets are home to gigantic refrigeration systems, I decided to investigate further and I did a little bit of digging on the internet to learn about the environmental impact of supermarkets in general. So my main sources consist of two websites, climatefriendlysupermarkets.org and Brightly. But while researching, I also gather information from a bunch of other sources. Now, both Climate Friendly Supermarkets and Brightly rank the eco-friendliness of popular supermarkets in the States, from most to least. But the two websites have slightly different metrics. So climatefriendlysupermarkets.org ranks the supermarkets based on technology adoption, refrigerant management, and policy commitment. Before I get into the rankings, I want to talk about something called HFC which stands for hydrofluorocarbon. <laughs> okay, so I know I just introduced the acronym IPCC two episodes ago, and now I'm introducing yet another acronym. But trust me, this one is very, very important to know. So HFC is a widely used refrigerant and a super pollutant that is commonly used in a lot of supermarkets. It's found in air conditioning systems, building insulation, fire extinguishing systems, and it's terrible for climate change because HFC is a greenhouse gas that is a thousand times more powerful than CO2, so it speeds up global warming and ozone depletion. Now, back in 2016, the Kigali Amendment was an international agreement that was signed to reduce the consumption and production of HFC globally. And it is a legally binding agreement that was signed in Kigali, which is the capital city of Rwanda, hence the name Kigali Amendment. And only in this year, in January 2021, did Biden formally ratify the Kigali Amendment in the United States. So all this is to say that climatefriendlysupermarkets.org's ranking is mainly based on which supermarkets are actively reducing their use of HFC in their refrigeration. Now, on the other hand, Brightly's ranking is not just based on technology and refrigeration. It's also based on the use of plastic bags and packaging, commitments to reduce food waste, in-store recycling, sustainable energy consumption, and if the store offers sustainable products. So I kind of cross-checked the two websites and compiled the results from both websites, and I'm going to walk you through the rankings. (laughs) Are you ready to find out how eco-friendly is your local supermarket? Okay. So number one on the list, the most eco-friendly grocery store in the States is Aldi, which currently has around 2,000 stores operating across the United States. Now, I've never heard of Aldi TBH because I live in Canada, but apparently Aldi is the fastest growing grocer in the United States right now. And what makes Aldi the most sustainable option is that it currently has 300 plus HFC free stores in operation, and all the new locations will also be HFC free. And it's public and transparent with its refrigerant leak rates. The company says it's installing transcritical CO2 refrigeration systems and will continue to install more. (laughs) You're probably wondering, What the F is a transcritical CO2 refrigeration system? I had to research that one too, see, and (laughs) this is how I often go down a rabbit hole sometimes. I look up one term I don't know, and then two hours later, I end up reading some academic paper on researchgate.com on the thermodynamic analysis of natural refrigerants based ejector expansion on refrigeration cycles. Anyway, basically, you just need to know that a transcritical CO2 refrigeration system is a climate friendly alternative to HFC based refrigeration systems. And as we talked about earlier, HFC causes global warming and climate change, and it's extremely bad. So Aldi is a supermarket that is trying to shift away from all of that, and it is a leader in innovative refrigeration technology. Also, Aldi uses interior LED lighting. I mean, are there any supermarkets in the States that still use incandescent light bulbs? Really? 
because that's just awfully inefficient and ridiculous. Also, Aldi vows to power its operation with clean solar energy to minimize energy consumption from the grid. Its goal is to reduce its greenhouse gas by 26% by 2025. Now, when it comes to reducing plastic bag usage, Aldi charges customers if they don't bring their own bags. The cool thing is that 90% of Aldi's products are Aldi exclusive, which means that being the only downstream stakeholder, Aldi has a lot of say in how these products are packaged, and it plans to make all its products reusable, recyclable, and compostable by 2025. The store also collects cardboard, electronic devices, batteries for recycling. Pretty cool. I mean, if you live close to an Aldi, it's worth shopping at. Next on the list, number two, second most eco-friendly grocer is Whole Foods. Phew, thank God Whole Foods is relatively sustainable and lives up to its name in eco-marketing. Now imagine if Whole Foods ended up on the bottom of the list and how ironic that would be. <laughs> Although Whole Foods is expanding rapidly, many people still consider it to be a luxury grocer. But the good thing is that Whole Foods has a strong sustainability ethos. When it comes to refrigeration technology, Whole Foods has numerous stores using natural refrigerants such as CO2 and propane and other alternatives. But many of its stores, unfortunately, still use HFC. But Whole Foods is aggressively retrofitting its stores. In 2008, Whole Foods became the first U.S. grocer to eliminate single-use plastic bags. If you've ever shopped at Whole Foods, you will realize that they only offer paper bags, pretty much. In 2019, Whole Foods eliminated all styrofoam meat trays, which is very significant because styrofoam is worse than plastic. But then again, my podcast is called Make Peace Not Beef, <laughs> so why eat meat at all? Go vegan! <laughs> Speaking of that, Whole Foods has a lot of vegan and vegetarian options, which I very much appreciate. And since I'm moving to Cambridge next year, I know there's a Whole Foods right next to Harvard, so that's probably where I'll be running most of my errands. The other awesome thing about Whole Foods is that it pledges to reduce its food waste by half by 2030 through buying imperfect produce, donating food to food banks, composting, or upcycling or repurposing underused food, probably using them in their prepared meals which I think is pretty smart. I mean, let's say 40% of sweet potatoes end up being unsold. Why not just make some prepared meals using those sweet potatoes and sell them to the customers the next day? Whole Foods also offers in-store recycling for electronic devices and batteries. It also has partnerships with the Rainforest Alliance, Fair Trade America, Equitable Food Initiative, and was the first US grocer to partner with the Marine Stewardship Council for Sustainable Fishing. I think this is very great. Although, once again, after watching Seaspiracy, which basically contested that there is no such thing as sustainable fishing and we're headed to a world with more plastic than fishes in the ocean. So my best advice is still to minimize your meat, fish, and dairy consumption as much as possible. Now, number three on the list is Target. This one actually surprised me. I thought Target was gonna be somewhere at the bottom of the list. But no, it turns out Target is relatively sustainable compared to many other grocers, which we will get into. So why is Target the third most eco-friendly supermarket? Well, Target received a high score in refrigerant management and public commitments. In 2019, Target pledged to become 100% renewable powered by 2030, and rooftop solar systems are already underway and installed in many stores. Needless to say, Target is also investing in HFC-free refrigeration technology, LED lights, and the cool thing is, Target has installed motion sensors in its refrigerators. And I'm guessing these motion sensors are used to save lighting energy or dimming the refrigeration lights when there are no customers nearby. When it comes to packaging and plastic, so Target does offer eco-friendly options, product lines, including zero-waste hair care product lines but most of its products still use plastic packaging. The good thing is Target is a member of the new plastics economy global commitment, and it's an initiative to reduce plastic packaging. And Target is working to remodel its products such that by 2025, all of its products are either reusable, recyclable, or compostable. And they want to make sure that by 2025, 30% of their plastic packaging either comes from post-consumer plastic or bio-based content. I actually think this part is worth scrutinizing. 
In the previous episode on Seaspiracy where I spoke with Dr. Scott Coffin, recycling is pretty much a myth, right? I mean, only 9% of plastic actually gets recycled. The rest, 91%, ends up in landfill. And then out of the 9% of plastic that gets recycled, it's only recycled once before it ends up in landfill. So plastic has a very short lifespan, but it sticks around forever. So the key is to uncover plastic alternatives that are fully compostable. And then when it comes to plastic bags, unfortunately, Target still offers them, and it's up to the customer to bring their own bag. So when you go to Target, make sure you bring your own bag. Target also has a very comprehensive climate policy, covering everything from their use of renewable energy to mitigating deforestation, to transparent chemical management in their beauty and household cleaning products, to the use of certified palm oil. So I went on their website and discovered a ton of PDFs documenting how they plan to make the transition. But also because Target vows to become net zero by 2040, which is 10 years ahead of the Paris Agreement. So this giant corporation is facing a lot of pressure to transform, and it has to do it fast. But I do have to applaud Target for being very transparent in their communication and planning to shift to a circular, environmentally sustainable business model. Number four is Kroger. Now, I've never heard of Kroger, but doing some research reveals that it's the name of the parent company. So Kroger actually owns a bunch of chains in the States, including Food for Less, Fred Meyer, Harris Teeter, Marianos. Anyway, Kroger is also slowly shifting toward HFC-free technology and has been very public about its commitment to reducing its leaks. I'm not going to comment too much on Kroger because there are other grocers far more well-known that are worth talking about. Number five on the list is Walmart. Yes, the number one Fortune Global 500 company in the world, Walmart. So according to climatefriendlysupermarkets.org, Walmart has yet to install a single HFC free system in its US stores, and it has yet to adopt HFC free technologies. Although all the Walmart distribution centers use low GWP refrigerants, and by the way, GWP stands for global warming potential, so it's meeting the bare minimum, but it's definitely not a sustainability leader. But remodeling Walmart is tough because Walmart's got 4,700 stores in the US alone. So imagine remodeling each and every one of those stores. It's not easy, but it's necessary. But what about plastic bags? <laughs> Walmart definitely hands out plastic bags and does not shy away from plastic packaging. In the media, Walmart has a pretty bad rep for sustainability, as we probably all know, and it's implementing a sweeping quote-unquote green overhaul of its operations. But I have to say, I went to Target's website and checked out their climate pledge, and then I went on Walmart's website and checked out their sustainability practice. I have to say that Target does a much better job than Walmart in communicating their climate goals. And comparing revenues, Target's revenue is around $93 billion, Walmart is around 559 billion, which is six times that of Target. Now, for a company with Walmart's size and capital, I would expect it to invest a lot more in decarbonizing its supply chain. So Walmart still has a long way to go. Number six on the list is Costco. Every American family's favorite bulk store and one-stop shop. Probably. Costco, like Walmart, does not have a single HFC free store, although Costco's distribution centers are now using HFC free cooling. Costco is also not very transparent with its refrigerant leak rates, nor has it changed its reporting standards over the years. You would think that buying in bulk leads to less packaging, and while that is true in many cases, it's not the case for Costco. This part is going to make you laugh, but Basically, at Costco, a lot of their bulk-sized items are just regular-sized items bundled together in a plastic wrap. So, for example, their bulk Nutella is basically two jars of regular-sized Nutella bundled together with an extra layer of plastic wrap around it. What the heck, Costco? This is so unnecessary. You might as well just place them individually on the shelf and make a label that states a discount is applied if you buy two. But, of course, consumerism breeds laziness and convenience culture. 
And most people operate on autopilot, so they rather grab a bundle instead of taking two jars individually off the shelf. <laughs> Shaking my head. Also, Costco is notorious for its unethical sourcing of food, with its seafood from unsustainable fisheries that are overfished and destroying the oceans. And they got their eggs from cool battery cage farms, chickens that are buried in their own feces all the way up to their necks. I mean, if you look at these accusations, most of them are related to animal agriculture. Once again, adopting a plant-based diet is probably the best way to eliminate all these issues at once. Last and definitely least eco-friendly on the list, coming in at number seven, is Trader Joe's. Yes, Trader Joe's got unbeatable prices, but unfortunately, it is the least environmentally friendly grocer. The ironic thing is, Trader Joe's is acquired by the same company that owns Aldi, which ranks number one on the list. Hmm. So Trader Joe had a settlement with the EPA back in 2016 over a violation of the Clean Air Act, in which it was mandated to fix its refrigerators, leak issues, and cut greenhouse gases. However, the company has made zero public commitments to phase out of HFC refrigeration, which is very problematic. Also, looking at packaging, almost every produce at Trader Joe's is wrapped in plastic and styrofoam trays, from bell peppers to mushrooms to broccoli to zucchini, resulting in excessive plastic waste. And I went on Trader Joe's website <laughs> to examine their sustainability practices. And their sustainability page is a very short one pager that literally has four very short paragraphs, whereas Target has a full blown section on their website detailing their sustainability practices and climate pledges and research findings. So Trader Joe is basically not doing much to decarbonize its operations, and this is very problematic, given the scale at which it operates and the magnitude of climate change. Trader Joe definitely needs to step up this game. So the final ranking goes as follows: from most eco-friendly to least. So it's Aldi, Whole Foods, Target, Kroger, Walmart, Costco, and then Trader Joe's. Now, as of two hours ago, I read a news article that just came out stating that the EPA, which stands for the Environmental Protection Agency, under the Biden administration, is aggressively limiting the use of hydrofluorocarbons in refrigerators and air conditioning since it is such a potent warming gas. The EPA has finalized a new target to slash HFC by 85% in the next 15 years as part of the plan to combat climate change. This is great news because now it puts pressure on major supermarkets and the automobile industry and other heavy industries to redesign their cooling and refrigeration systems and forces them to remodel and adapt. And as I talked about earlier, the Kigali Amendment was finally ratified in the United States this year, so we should expect to see a dramatic reduction in HFC, not only in supermarkets but across all sectors. In the meanwhile, though. Please do your part and support grocery stores and supermarkets that avoid the use of HFC. If you live outside of the U.S. and wonder how you can shop more climate consciously, I have a few quick tips for you when you go grocery shopping. Number one, bring a reusable tote bag with you when you go grocery shopping. Preferably a fashionable one like the Make Peace Not Beef tote bag, wink wink, so you don't have to use up more plastic bags. Number two. Buy more fresh produce and less processed food. Usually, processed food like chips or cookies contain way more plastic packaging than fresh produce. And also, the more processed a food is, the more carbon emissions it generates during manufacturing. Plus, ultra-processed food is also terrible for your health and your waistline. I mean, all that sugar and sodium and fat. So avoid that if you can. Next time you want to pick up a bag of chips. I suggest you flip the package to the other side and read the ingredients, and figure out how many of those ingredients you actually recognize. Probably less than 10%. <laughs> exactly. Ask yourself, what are you actually putting into your body? Is it food or chemicals? Number three, reduce your meat, dairy, and seafood consumption. I know I've said this many, many times, but this is possibly the most effective way to combat climate change. My podcast is called Make Peace Not Beef for a reason, because animal agriculture is a principal contributor to climate change and also animal cruelty. 
So give soy milk or oat milk a chance. Number four, pay attention to the packaging of what you buy and choose products with minimal packaging. Does the product come in a glass jar that can be recycled or an aluminum can, or is it wrapped in three layers of single-use plastic? For example, your favorite Ben & Jerry ice cream cartons will end up in landfill because it's got a layer of plastic lining of polyethylene. Well, I use Ben & Jerry as an example, but most ice cream cartons are not recyclable, I repeat. <laughs> For that reason, nowadays I actually buy more popsicles than cartons because it's got less plastic packaging. Well, you know, I'm more of an extreme case, but it's important to at least be mindful of the packaging of the stuff you buy. Number five. Pay attention to the origin of your product. Choose local products, seasonal products, and local brands as it minimizes shipping, transportation, and storage, and ultimately carbon emissions. Okay, so this makes a good segue into my next point because I now want to talk about the importance of taking individual action in the case of grocery shopping. If you have access to a farmer's market, I highly, highly encourage you to shop at a local farmer's market. Not only is the food much more fresh, nutritious, and delicious, but you're also helping the planet in a very significant way, and you're supporting local farmers. So why is this important? Because when you shop at a supermarket like Target, you have to think about food miles, right? Or the distance between where that food is grown and what it takes to transport and store all that food until it ends up on the shelf of your supermarket. And because there is a time lag in the transportation, it reduces the shelf life and freshness and nutritional value of the produce. So if you live in New Jersey, the strawberries that you buy at Target is probably already a week old by the time it ends up on the shelves of your local Target. Because of the time it takes to transport those strawberries from a farm somewhere in California all the way to New Jersey. Whereas if you buy from a farmer's market, the strawberry is probably freshly picked that morning or packed the night before, and it also tastes way better. But transportation is only one aspect of the carbon footprint associated with supermarkets and grocery stores. Cooling and refrigeration is necessary during transportation to ensure freshness. So once again, think about the carbon footprint there. If we can somehow bypass all this transportation and cooling, then we can significantly reduce the carbon footprint of our groceries. Now, you're probably wondering, Lily, why can't I just grow my own produce in my own backyard? Great question. I mean, if you can, go ahead. That's definitely the best way to go about it. Grow your own produce. Actually, there's something called vertical farming, which grows produce in stacked layers in buildings under carefully controlled environments sometimes without soil, using hydroponics, which is an emerging solution to combat climate change and world hunger because there's way less water use and shipping associated with produce grown using vertical farming. Along with vertical farming, there's also something called urban farming, which is growing produce on rooftop gardens, and these are both urban solutions to providing farm fresh produce. These are both very fascinating technologies, so definitely look into that if you're interested. So that's pretty much it for today. We discussed a very important topic, which is the massive environmental impact of cooling and refrigeration. And specifically, I talked about HFC or hydrofluorocarbon, which is a widely used but ozone depleting refrigerant and a potent warming gas commonly used in cooling and HVAC found in many supermarkets. Then we talked about the eco-friendliness of supermarkets in which the majority of their electricity, close to 60%, comes from their massive refrigeration systems. So this is not something to be overlooked. Then I ranked the supermarkets for you and evaluated their sustainable practices. So Whole Foods is actually a pretty good choice. And Trader Joe's and Walmart, not so much. The key takeaway is shop local, shop small, shop seasonal if you can, and if you cannot, then the next time you're at your local supermarket, pay attention to their sustainable practices and also pay attention to the choices you make for your health and the environment. These things do matter and they add up. Even though grocery shopping seems so trivial, it's something that every one of us does on a regular basis. So by consciously choosing where we shop and what products we buy, we can support companies and brands that incorporate sustainable practices and incentivize others to make that change. All right, peacemakers, happy grocery shopping or happy cooking, and I'll see you in the next episode.